Colossians 3.13, bear with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to this verse, we pray that you will shed light in the dark recesses of our souls, a place where sin still continues. We pray that you'll lift the cover over what is unworthy of you in our hearts and show us, Lord, your good way of forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Here in Colossians chapter 3, Paul is writing about the Christian life. And part of this is forgiveness. Forgiving people, forgiving each other, he says. And it's worth making the point at the start that he is writing to Christians. He's writing to people who have a living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Forgiving people is generally a good thing. If I say to you, you should forgive, not many people will disagree with me, perhaps. Forgiving is good for relationships and it's good for your own peace of mind. Someone who does not forgive can end up as quite a resentful, angry and embittered person. And I'm told this can even affect your physical health, being linked to such things as arthritis, apparently. But Paul does not mention any of these things in our verse. Colossians 3.13, he says, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. So I take it from that he is writing to believers in Jesus. He's writing to people who can say, yes. The Lord has forgiven me. Paul then does not think that people outside of Christ have much prospect of being genuinely forgiving people. Paul and behind him God, who inspired him to write this letter, Paul would say and God would say, To anybody who's outside of Christ, the message is very simple. Come to Christ. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord. Accept the love of Christ in dying for sins and find forgiveness in him. Start there. Start there. All of the teaching here that Paul has for us, all of the teaching of God on how to live, is for people who have accepted Jesus Christ. So start there. If you're not a Christian, start with Jesus Christ. Start by receiving him, believing in him, and then you can begin to live for him in the ways that we read here in Colossians 3. Start with him. It's worth saying also that here in this chapter, Paul, and therefore God, focuses very much on relationships between Christians in the local Christian community, the local church. It is striking how often this comes up. It's not the whole of Christian living. There is teaching on self-control. There is teaching on how to relate within a family, parents and children and so on. There's teaching on how to relate at work, put here in terms of slaves and slave owners. But a very great deal of the focus here is on how we relate to each other as fellow believers and fellow members of a local church. This is evidently much more important in the mind of God than it often is in our minds and our thinking about our lives. Let me show you what I mean. Paul talks about dealing with certain attitudes, verse 7 and 8 of Colossians 3, and then if you've got it open in front of you, verse 9, lying. Lying is wrong. We shouldn't lie. In every situation, it's important to be honest and truthful. But look at The situation in Paul's mind as he writes about lying. Do not lie, he says, to each other. He's thinking about the damage that lying can do above all in the church. He's thinking about relationships between Christians and how important it is for us to be truthful with each other in the local Christian community. Or again, further down, peace, the importance of the peace of Christ in your heart. Verse 19, Colossians 3 verse 19. Peace in your heart, apparently in this verse, has something to do with the fact 
that we all belong together in one body. And again, it's church life that seems to be at the center of Paul's thinking and therefore at the center of God's will for your Christian life and mine. God would say to us through this chapter, how well are you relating to the other people in your church? And I might think the big questions of my life is how I'm getting on at home with my wife or how I'm getting on with my job, all that kind of thing. Or have I got self-control or how is my daily Bible reading going and so on. And these are all also featured in this chapter. But much more than we tend to think the issue is how do we relate together? How well are we combined and joined together as one body in the local church? How is that going? How is your relationship with your fellow Christians? Even during this lockdown period, how well are you keeping that contact, that connection with those brothers and sisters in Christ? It's a challenging perspective. It's a challenging perspective. And I think from this verse here, Colossians 3 verse 13, our verse today, we can add a further assumption underlying these words. The assumption is this, that we will hurt each other in church life. We will offend each other. We will upset each other. There will be pain that we cause to each other, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes, sadly, intentionally. And this is hard to get our heads around as Christians because we feel that it should not be so. And in a sense, we're right. Church should be what they call a safe space. A place where people don't feel threatened, attacked, criticised, picked on or bullied. A place where all is sweetness and light and all relationships are harmonious and positive and affirming, constructive and strong. We feel and know that our church and every church should work in that way. But the sad fact is, and the assumption behind this verse, it isn't always the case. It isn't always the case. People can receive wounds and hurts in the Christian community that are deeper and more painful than the wounds and hurts they've received anywhere else. And although that grieves us and disappoints us, this verse takes that fact into account and tells us then to bear with each other and to forgive each other. And if it was not so, if there were no painful churches, no difficult Christian relationships, this verse never would need to have been written. I found in my experience as a pastor that people will come to our church from other churches from time to time. And there was a little bit of a pattern to this. Somebody would turn up and after three or four Sundays, they'd ask to have a word with me and they would tell me about the church they came from. And there would be various issues with it. it. Might be a doctrinal issue or an issue to do with church life, something unbiblical. And they would say to me, so glad we've come to your church. Your church isn't like that at all. And as a young and rather naive pastor, I would say to myself, yes, you're right, you know. Actually, our church is different. I'm so glad you noticed that. I've thought that myself. And I'm pleased you realise it as well. What I did not realise in my naivety was that behind these doctrinal differences or whatever they were, were raw wounds, raw wounds of personal hurt. And these were often then people who'd left their former churches because of things that had been said, ways that they'd been treated. And what I also didn't realise was that these same people would, within a period of six months or so, and this happened several times, within a period, say, of six months, they would then also find our church hurtful, disappointing and painful. And after six months, they would have a meeting with me again or a phone call, and it would be very different from the first one. It would be full of reproaches full of criticisms of our church and they'd be off, gone to try the next church up the road. And it seems to me, reflected on that experience, that one thing 
I needed to learn and we all need to learn is that churches will only work on the basis of bearing with each other and forgiving each other. It's the only way people are going to stay together. It's the only way we're ever going to avoid the syndrome of people leaving and trying the next church and leaving and trying the church after that and so on and so on and so on. To stay together in the church in which God has placed us requires that we bear with each other and forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven us. <coughs> Excuse me. So, how has the Lord forgiven us then? How has the Lord forgiven you? It seems to me in the Bible that the Lord's forgiveness is something total, complete, permanent. A permanent, complete and total release from all the judicial consequences of sin. Everything that sin deserves. Everything that your sin deserves. God sets it aside. If sin comes between you and God, he removes that barrier. If sin demands the curse of God, and it does, he changes the curse into blessing. If sin calls down the condemnation of God, and it does, he changes the condemnation to acceptance and welcome. If sin calls down the wrath and anger and judgment of God, and that is what it deserves, he changes that anger to love and peace and favour. That is the forgiveness of God. And it is astonishing. It is astonishing. The more you realise about yourself, the more you compare and contrast yourself with what God says in the Bible, the more you realise this many-headed monster of, of sin that is still sadly very much alive in us as Christians, the more amazing it is that God should forgive in the way that he does. Let me give you some Bible pictures of this breathtaking forgiveness of God. You have a daughter who's on the point of getting married and you have hanging up in your wardrobe her beautiful white wedding dress. You know that on her wedding day she is going to look amazing. Your grandson is with you and it's paint day so he has his pots of paint and it's a messy but that's okay because you've got the apron on him and, and the, the newspaper down everywhere so it's all under control but uh, your attention is drawn away for a few moments during those moments grandson thinks he'd like to stop painting and explore the inside of the wardrobe now grandson does not first of all remove his apron or wash his hands as he would do if you were there no he just wades straight in his hands covered with red paint so that by the time you return that beautiful white dress is stained red all over how can you possibly remove the stains as well remove red stains from a white wedding dress as remove the stain and guilt of your own sin but listen to this come now let us reason together says the Lord Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are like crimson, they shall become like wool. Isaiah 1 verse 18. God can do what we could never do. He could take the stained, spoiled, crimson thing that is your life and make it pure and white, forgiven. <clears throat> Again, another picture from the Bible. Here is your sin this time like a lead weight that you carry with you everywhere, crushing you down. A great lump, a solid, heavy lump of reasons for God to reject you. And it goes with you wherever you go. Until the day God forgives you. And he removes that weight from you in the Bible picture. And the Bible says he will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. So there over the side of the boat it goes, that great weight of sin. 
and it drops down, 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 down through the water, and it's gone, and you will never see it again. Micah chapter 7, verse 19. What a great thing it is that God forgives sin. <clears throat> Isaiah 44, verse 22. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud, and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. So here you are, again in a boat in the middle of the ocean. You don't have sat-nav. You're navigating by the night sky and the stars. Here's the constellation that points to the north. So now you get your compass bearings from it. But now the mist comes down. And you can't see the sky. It's still there. You just can't see it. You can't reckon with it. You can't take it into account. It's hidden from you. Just so God hides your sins from view, from his view, so that he no longer reckons with them. He no longer takes them into account in his dealings with you. He no longer reckons up the guilt and punishment of your sins. is gone. Forgiven. How wonderful. In the Old Testament, there's the picture of the scapegoat. Have you come across this in Leviticus 16? That's just worth turning to if you've got your Bible there. Leviticus chapter 16. Every year in Leviticus 16, the Israelites had a great day of atonement. And they conducted a number of different ceremonies on that day, according to the law here that God gave through Moses. And all of those ceremonies were to do with guilt and sin and forgiveness. And one of them involves this scapegoat. Leviticus 16 verse 20. When Aaron has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the live goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. It's a symbolic gesture that God gave them, that they would they would transfer symbolically their guilt onto this scapegoat once a year. It didn't actually take away sin, but it was a picture of forgiveness. You imagine all the sins you've committed, all the reasons for God to reject you, all the reasons why he might be against you, all the things that would shut you out of heaven, and here they go onto the goat and they're gone. As the goat wanders off, so your guilt goes with it. It's just a picture, but it helps us understand this invisible reality of God forgiving us. In Colossians 3.13, the word forgive is the word of releasing a debt, of discharging somebody from their obligation to pay you back. So sin here then is what we owe is us not giving God what we owe to him. I wonder if you realise what you owe to God. See, we're his creatures. He made us. And so we all owe him, every human being, every single man, woman and child owes to God a lifetime of love, obedience, service and worship. That's irrespective of your nationality or your culture or your background. God made you. The living God made each one of us. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ made us and put us here in his image. And so he's entitled then to receive from us love, obedience, service and worship. These things we owe him. And if we have not given to him what we owe him, we therefore have accumulated a debt. How big that debt must be. How big that debt must be. Because you see, it's fine to say, well, I, I worship God on Sunday morning. I mean, I don't 
worship him every day. I worshipped him on Sunday and I worshipped him on Tuesday when I had my Bible time and I served him to some extent on Wednesday when I did that helpful thing for the neighbour. And sometimes I worship God, sometimes I love God. But that's like saying sometimes I pay my mortgage. I mean, I paid it in January. Do you really want it in February as well? I mean, I paid it for six months of 2020. Surely you don't expect the full 12 months, do you? <laughs> well, yes, they do. Of course they do. And God expects and he's entitled to receive a lifetime of love and service and obedience and worship. And to the extent that we've fallen short, we've accumulated a debt. And what will happen with this debt? How will we pay it back? How will we repay to God what we owe him? Wonderfully, when God forgives, he just cancels the debt. He cancels it. Once and for all, he sets it aside and says, don't worry, there's no repayment. I'm letting you off the whole thing. How amazing is that? This is how God forgives. So in our verse in Colossians 3.13 then, the instruction is this, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, forgive each other. Bear in mind God's attitude to you. Bear in mind everything that he's released you from. Everything that he no longer holds against you. Everything that he will never reckon against you. Everything you will never have to answer for. Everything that will never come into the judgment. Everything that will never condemn you, curse you, shut you out of heaven. Bearing in mind how the Lord has forgiven you, he says. Forgive each other. Cast aside those grievances. Let go of ill will. Take no thought for revenge or payback. Set aside the idea that the one who has hurt you must also then suffer. Set it aside and forgive. Now when God forgives, it seems to me, this is something that he does completely and he does it in an instant. We are not masters of our emotions to that extent. So to forgive for us is very often a long process, a process of repeating the same prayers and the same Bible verses to ourselves to get this forgiveness into our hearts so that it stays there. So that the thoughts of anger and revenge are gone. This is quite a process and quite a work. A member from our old church, Shirley, who had been a Christian since she was a teenager, and as a young woman she married a, a Christian man. Well, she thought he was a Christian man. They had three children together. Money was always an issue. He liked to spend it. Sometimes he spent money that they didn't have. But then when the children were still quite small, he left her for another woman. And there she was with debts, three children to bring up, and all the pain of her husband preferring someone else to her. And all that sense of injustice that he'd broken all those promises and done her wrong. And he had done her wrong. There's no pretending otherwise. But she knew she had to forgive him. But she did not feel like forgiving him. She felt that he should pay, that he should hurt the way she hurt, that justice should be done. So began, it, as she described it to me, a long process. A process that took years of praying, of looking again at the Bible, of thinking again about her own forgiveness and how God had forgiven her, of asking God's help, of preaching to herself of challenging herself, of fighting that vengeful attitude. So that when I knew her as an old woman, she could honestly say after all those years, she wished her ex-husband no harm. She prayed for him, she prayed for his salvation, she wanted good things for him. And all that anger and resentment had gone. But it took that long for her to get there. Friend, if you have somebody you need to forgive, it's unlikely to be a work of a moment. 
if somebody's really hurt you and wronged you, then you will need to grapple. You will need to grapple with this, perhaps over many years. And know your attitude and know your heart and pray and seek the Lord. And remind yourself again of how much he's forgiven you. Well, somebody will say listening to this sermon, I'm, I'm fine. Actually, I'm fine. Certainly in terms of the church, I'm fine. I don't need to forgive anybody anything. Everything's fine here. Well, let me just see if I can help you lift the car bonnet on this so you can see what's going on underneath. Examine yourself in the light of this scripture. Proverbs 24, 17, 18. Use this as a way of looking at yourself and learning what makes you tick. This is what these verses say. Proverbs 24, verse 17 and 18. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn his way, his anger from him. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Just to, just to help you be a little bit more aware of yourself, can I ask you this question? Is there somebody who secretly you are glad when things go badly for them? You would never say anything to them. You would never attack them in any way. That wouldn't be Christian. But you see something go wrong for them and you think, that's good. That's how it should be. That's what they deserve. I'm pleased that they're struggling. Let's just be honest before the Lord here. Do you rejoice when certain people stumble? Is your heart glad when they fall? That's just a sign, isn't it, that we still have some way to go in forgiving that person. They wronged us in some way and we didn't fight back, we didn't argue with them, we didn't attack them, we didn't say anything, but we've kept it inside. And secretly now we see they have problems of some kind. And it makes us glad because we haven't yet forgiven them the way the Lord's forgiven us. Friends, please examine yourself at this point and be honest. Most of us have got a ways to go with this issue of forgiveness, even in our church circles. We're not as far on as we'd like to think. Well, then you can get to the point with people where you do forgive them and your attitude to them is genuinely a peaceful one and you genuinely want only good things for them and you pray for them that God will bless them and do them good and that they might be in heaven when they die. But you can't have anything to do with them. This happens sometimes in life. There's a certain person at work who doesn't treat you well and it would be easy to get upset and annoyed with them and resentful but you're not going to do that you're going to forgive them but you're going to avoid them try and work somewhere else away from them if you can that happens that happens or in your own family there's someone who's just caused a lot of trouble and a lot of problems and behaved in a thoroughly selfish way you don't want payback. You're not holding it over them. You're not condemning them. You wish peace on them, genuinely from the heart. But you know you can't mix with them. <laughs> You're going to stay away from them. Sometimes in the extended family, that's the way it has to be. In church life, that's not enough. In church life, it can't stop there. Two people are members of the same body. They belong to each other like bricks in the same building. They are branches of the same vine. You cannot operate your church life in the way you operate in your family or at work by just saying, well, I'll avoid so-and-so then. You forgive them, yes. You want peace for them, yes. 
but you've got to continue to relate to them. How does that work? In the whole of the four Gospels, the word church only comes twice. The Lord Jesus taught about the church in the Gospels on two occasions. There are many things that the Lord Jesus could have said about church life that he didn't say. Important things that we often worry over and perhaps argue over as well. How long should a sermon be in church? Should it be 30 minutes or two hours? Lord Jesus never said. What kind of music should there be in church? Should there be guitar and drums? Should there be organ? Should there be singing without any instruments? The Lord never spelt that out. Should a church service be an hour long and then come back for another hour in the evening? Or should it be six hours long and take up the whole day? As it does in some cases among our African brothers and sisters. The Lord didn't specify that. But what he did say focuses again on this question of how we relate to each other. When the Lord Jesus thought ahead during his time on earth and he thought to the existence of the church after he died and rose again and he thought, what do I need to leave with people so that they can be my church? The thing he talks about in Matthew 18 is how we relate together. So will you look at Matthew 18, verse 15? I hope this is a very familiar verse to you. It's a verse that would do a lot to heal many of the relationship problems in church life. Just this one verse, actually, of the Lord Jesus would do so much to bring us together and make for good and peaceful church harmony. Here's a situation where your brother has wronged you or your sister and you don't miss them any harm. You've forgiven them from the heart, but you've got to live with them in the same church. You've got to get on together. And Jesus says this, and it's as serious as anything else he says in the whole Bible. It's as important as anything else he says. And he means for us to take it as seriously as we take all his promises, warnings and commands. If your brother sins against you, Matthew 18 verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Isn't that beautifully simple? You're not looking for revenge. You're not trying to hurt them. You're not trying to wound them. But you've got to carry on living with them in the same church. So you go and talk to them. You don't talk to anyone else. Don't bring anyone else into it. You talk to them. And they'll listen to you. And peace is restored. And that's the end of it. If they don't listen to you and they dig in and they become stubborn, there's a procedure to follow that the Lord himself lays out. And you can see how seriously he takes this question of church relationships. Because it even gets, as you work through that procedure, it even gets to the point of a meeting of the whole church to bring about church discipline. That's how big of an issue it is to him. What I found when I talk to people about this is that on the one hand, the sin that has been sinned against him is incredibly serious. And then on the other hand, suddenly it doesn't really matter at all. What do I mean by that? Well, here's a conversation that somebody might have with me as a pastor. Pastor, you know so-and-so in the church? Well... I'm really upset with them and I don't think I can be around them anymore and I don't want to run this club with them that we've been running because they've done and said this and this and I'm, it's really hurt me. I'm forgiving them but I really don't want anything more to do with them. Okay. I say, I say then, okay, but you're turning the wrong person. Well, you're the pastor. I expect you to sort this kind of thing out. No, that's not how it works. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Don't tell anybody else, not even the pastor. Go and tell him his fault. And then suddenly the mood changes. Oh, it's nothing. It's not that serious. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that important. Oh, I, oh no, I don't think I should go and talk to them about it. Oh, no, 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 it's nothing really. 
one moment it's so serious <laughs> that you're breaking off relationships with this person who's a fellow church member. The next minute, it's not serious enough for you to go and talk to them. Yes, it's hard, isn't it, to do what Jesus says. It is hard. It's not easy. But it's the way of health and life and peace and growth in the church. And it is our Lord's command. So if your brother sins against you, forgive him as the Lord has forgiven you. And if it's too big of a thing just for you to let it go and forget about it, go and talk to him. Go and talk to him. Don't spread it all around everyone else first. Just go one on one. Nobody else needs to know about it at this stage. And if it really starts to get out of hand and the other guy doesn't think they've done anything wrong and it's all a bit confrontational and argumentative and problematic, that's when you bring other people in. A challenging procedure to follow, but a healthy one and beneficial to your life and the life of your church. Bear with each other. Back in Colossians 3 verse 15. Bear with each other. If one of you has a complaint against another, forgive. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Well, there are some things, aren't there, that, that come between us that are not really sins. They're not really offences. They're not really wrong in themselves. They're just a bit aggravating. They just kind of grate on you a bit. Just rub you up the wrong way. It's a bit awkward. It's just... It's just in that case, just, just bear with it. Just bear with it. Just learn to live with it. There's a dear woman who came to our church in Watford. She's now in glory. For most of her life, she had mental health problems. And uh, she was in a, a care in a community home in Watford and she'd walk through with her friend to church every Sunday. And uh, she would come out with the most awkward things in conversation. Sometimes they were sinful, and then one of us would say to her, Margaret, you can't say that, that's wrong. And she would, to be fair to her, she would accept that. She could be told, and she would humble herself to accept what she was told, to be fair to her. But a lot of what happened with her was, was just, it wasn't necessarily wrong, or certainly not wicked. It was just a little bit awkward to, to, to deal with. So, for example, she'd have the habit, when talking to you, of, coming right up to you, right into your face, close as she could get. A bit uncomfortable. It's not like a sin. There isn't a Bible verse that says don't do that. But how do, you, how do you live with that? I thought about this and I thought, well, look, I can't keep uh, walking the other way when she comes towards me. I'm the pastor. I should listen to what she has to say. And I don't want to have a big kind of complicated explanation about personal space and all that kind of thing which she would misunderstand and probably get upset about. What's the kindest and most sympathetic way of doing this? Well, I got to the habit of just holding something in my hand, holding something in front of me, just to create a little bit of distance between us. And it didn't seem to offend her or upset her. So that's how I was able to bear with that rather awkward behaviour. There'll be a lot of things like that in church life. There'll be a lot of things that are just awkward, and, and, and that Paul says, God says to the Apostle Paul, just, just roll with it. Don't let it stress you out. Just find a way of living with it, of working around it. Bear with each other. Bear with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgive. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And now just a word to finish then. For those who don't know whether you've been forgiven or not. Has the Lord forgiven you? Have you received Christ Jesus as Lord and Saviour? Turn with me to Isaiah 55. Let's end with these verses. Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. Have you got a Bible handy to turn it up? Wonderful words of invitation for those who are still outside of Christ and not sure whether God's forgiveness really is for you. Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. 
and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So these verses say, look for God. Call out to him in prayer. He's not far away. Talk to him. Address him. And these verses are specifically for who in verse 7? The wicked and the unrighteous. So if that's you, these words are for you. You're going to need to make some changes. You're going to need to give up doing what's wrong in verse 7. And even thinking what's wrong, verse 7. But if you turn to God, you will find that he has compassion on you. Mercy, tenderness. And he will abundantly pardon. He will abundantly pardon. These are great words for each and every person who has lived for themselves, who's offended God, who's sinned against God, who's done wrong, who's gone, no matter how serious. You can seek God, you can call on him, make the changes you need to make, turn to God, and he will forgive you. Let's pray. Lord, it is wonderful to us that you have forgiven us. We pray that we might see more clearly then what this means for the way we treat each other. We pray that we might know and understand how to forgive each other from the heart. How to bear with each other. How to make peace with each other. How to continue in one body. And we pray for those who are not yet believers in Christ, that they might turn to you and be pardoned, as we read in Isaiah 55. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.